make up a few for you. Uh, come on up here, Nicole. This is my wonderful, beautiful wife, Nicole. And uh, we are so happy. When I was up north, I pat we pastored a church, Cornerstone Assembly of God. And the former pastor uh, came and visited one Sunday. And and he he was the one that had had got this new building going, and, he, and they just had built this new building, and then, and then the Lord led him on. And he came into the church, and he was so happy, and he was, he was weeping, he was so happy that the church was going forward, that all of his work was not in vain. All the sacrifices, all the things, yeah. laid a really good foundation for the church to advance, and for the church to continue going. He was very happy that there was good leadership in the church. And when I came to this church, Hastings Assembly of God, uh, I really sensed a lot of, of, of foundation of, of sincere love toward one another, where people right. would put down their flesh and they would they would try to love one another. And uh, I really loved that that spirit that was here. And I just want to honor you, Pastor Clayton, and your wife yes. Debbie, for the foundation. Yes. There are so many good foundations that you guys have have yeah. had laid here that prepared right. the ground yeah. for us. And and I. Um, and we're we, we're kind of radical people in some ways, you know, and and I, I kept thinking, boy, I'm glad Pastor Clayton did that because if I, if I had done that, it wouldn't have worked. But he he took the hits for me so that I could go forward on some on some things, and uh, and I was so grateful. I was like, oh, thank you, Jesus. I didn't have to end that or do that. You know, he he had already laid the groundwork for that. So, do you have anything to say? No, we just when then we after. We were here for a while, then we met Pastor Clayton and Deb, and we were just like, wow, these, oh, these are just such good people. We just, you know, our hearts just knit together immediately. And then, um, and that was just when you visited a few years ago, and then we found out that they were endeavoring this, this new thing going into the college campuses, and we're like, okay, we need to get on board with that and support that. So we're just really excited for him to come and share with you what they're both doing. And uh, without further ado, ado we'll, uh, we'll invite you up, you and Deb, and bless you. Give him a hand. Well, good morning. I'm not going to take up any more time, but I'm going to let Debbie take up some time. Okay. And, uh, but I just want to say right off the bat, it's so good to see a lot of familiar faces. We love you. We've missed you. It's hard to believe it's been seven years ago, just a few months, just actually last the end of July. Wow. And uh, I, I was baffling in my own mind that, you know, when we started at Hastings, it was 2017. And I'm looking at these, you know, adults now that were little tiny kids then. And I'm going, man, what happened to me? I got old. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Debbie's here and she's going to share what God is uh, leading us into and what we're doing there in Buckeye Country. So many things are running through my head and all the things we wanted to share and stuff, but just when we left, you know, we had three um, children with us, um, two went with us, one still in high school. We now have two married adult children and um, one grandchild who just turned two. Uh, last month. So um, the unfortunate thing is that they are all still in Texas as we are in Ohio. That has been a hard thing. But the Lord knows my heart and my prayers. My children know my heart and my prayers. So, <laughs> but in this, you know, um, when God called us to leave seven years ago, he started us on a journey that we had no idea where it was going to go, how it was going to not end, but just continue even after our education that we went to Texas for. And the Lord began to just ask us to trust him more to, to if we wanted to walk on water, we had to get out of the boat. If we wanted to see him do miracles, we had to be in a place to receive miracles. And he began to ask us to do things like quit our job with no job lined up. Um, he asked us to go to Ohio to Central Ohio, where Ohio State University is, where I am Michigan, <laughs> University of Michigan, sorry all you state fans, and I will cheer for you if you're, you know, going against anyone else, but I am blue through and through, it is so hard to be there, um, 
But this is generally what I tell people, that God has called us to the gates of hell, and we are there snatching people out. <laughs> so somebody has to do it. But really, we are. Um, God called us to Columbus, to Central Ohio, um, to be part, um, to partner with full-time missionaries. We're missionary associates, which allows us to be able to still part work part-time if we want. Um, that way, we're still in the community. We want to live as missionaries, live and minister and work among the people. Our focus is the university district villages, which <coughs> means we are not necessarily on the campus of Ohio State University. We want to target the faculty, the influencers, the faculty, the staff, the business owners, the people that affect our students. We have heard story after story of Bible-believing people who send their Bible-believing children off to the university and they walk away from the Lord. Yeah. And it's happening in the education. They're being educated to do that. And we want to reach those that are educating our kids. Yeah. And getting them there. In the, in the, you know, so there's grad level students that are affecting those professors. So we want to live in those neighborhoods. We want to affect those people. They tend to be wealthy. They tend to be liberal. And wow, I've worked at some places since we've moved. And I've never been around so many liberal people before. And it really is real. And, yeah. and we've heard stories of of Christian professors who feel like they have to hide who they are. Everyone else gets to declare what they are, but as a Christian, you can't. So we want to go into these places that tend to be a little bit harder and are more diverse and reach them for the Lord. And so that is our goal. And right now, um, Columbus is the place where we're starting. And um, there are over 55 um, institutions of higher learning. So it isn't just OSU. There's Columbus State Community College, there's Capital University, there's Lincoln University, there's all these universities. And and so we are going to be on the campuses, but we're also focusing in the neighborhoods and stuff. So um, we just appreciate your prayers and, and everything. So and we have no idea totally what it's going to look like. We are planting churches in all of these areas. We have two that are already planted, and then we are actually um, co-leading um, a new one in a Clintonville neighborhood, and um, we're calling that Mission 614. So that is actually the area code of the Columbus area. So um, we're getting that started hopefully this fall. never worn one of these before, so I feel really cool today. <laughs> Jesse said, can you hear me? All right, I did it right. So far. I, uh, it's not here, right? I've never preached from my tablet before, and I thought I'd be cool, but I don't know that I'm cool yet. <laughs> so. Old school, yeah. All right. old school. But uh, it is a joy and a privilege to be here this morning to be with you. It's a really special day. Um, you're not aware of this, but the last time I stood and preached in a pulpit was this one right here. Seven years. Uh, haven't been in the pulpit. Haven't been in a place where I've been able to preach. I guess I could have gone out in the parking lot somewhere, but uh, don't know. I draw too many people in, but. Um, it's exciting for that. I got all dressed up for you even. I didn't do the tie. Pastor Al said, you know, you can do dress slacks. And, but my, my attire today when I go to church is jeans and a nice shirt. And I like to just be relaxed and, you know, enjoy being with God's people. And uh, we're, uh, we're excited about what God has led us into. I say excited now, but I'll be honest, in the beginning, when God put us with the Bennetts who we're working with, uh, and they shared their heart and their vision for what God had given them to do. I thought, wow, that's cool for you. <laughs> now, have you ever uh, been in that place where God is getting ready to prepare you for something? You go, wow, that's great for you. Yes. And so that's what I was like. That was my mindset. That was my heart. And we, I had already graduated with my MDiv. Uh, it's a four-year master's program. I made it. I survived. And I'm here to tell you. That I made it. So, um, uh, but you know, with all that education in my mind, it, it's like, okay, we did that, but that's not what it's all about. It's what do you have for us, Lord? What are the next steps that you have? 
And as I approached my time of graduating, I thought, okay, now it's time. God's going to start bringing and revealing what the next step is. Have you ever been in a place like that? You've been waiting on God to offer the next steps. And, yeah. and you get there and think, okay, it's going to happen. Well, it didn't happen. It took a few more years. Right. And it's like, okay, have I totally missed it? You know, what are you, what are you, uh, what are you up to, God? But um, God is faithful. And as you keep seeking His will... He will begin to reveal it and unfold yeah. it. And that's what He did for us. And we're no different than you. We're not any more special than anyone else that's here today. And uh, I believe God wants to reveal His will for you. Amen. And uh, I think sometimes we complicate it. We make it too hard. Yeah. And if we just sit back and relax and we learn to just trust in the Lord and we find our joy in Him, He is faithful to uh, show us What's next? Because it's not about us, is it? It's about Him. But we forget that because we're very selfish beings. We're very selfish creatures. Um, let me get to the Word this morning because I don't want to ramble on about other stuff that's, that's not so important. The Word of God is central here. And so, <clears throat> Pastor Al, I don't have a canned message, so I... He kept telling me, he kept telling me, well, you know, we want you to, brother, just... You know, feel whatever God's leading you to speak and no canned messages. I said, well, I've not even been a missionary long enough to have a canned message. Too. So I got to work on my canned message still. All right. I got to work on that. And uh, but I really do feel that God led me to some scripture here recently that I think there's a message here, at least for someone here in this place this morning. The title of the message is simply this. Who am I? Who am I? I think we all at times in our life, we struggle with our identity. We hit identity crises. And um, we're going to see here in Judges chapter 6, if you want to turn there, we're going to look at a section of scripture that if you've been in church and you grew up in church in Sunday school, you've heard this story many times. How many of you know who Gideon is? Yeah. Gideon. Hey, can I use this? Yeah, sure. I'm getting like all this dry cotton now. Okay. Did you, did you spit in it for me? <laughs> did you anoint it? <laughs> he didn't know. Okay, all right. I'm so desperate, I'll take it anyway. So. But Gideon. Um, let's go ahead and just read. And so I was using these before I left, and I can hardly read anything anymore without them. So it's my Clark Kent glasses. Like, or Kent Clark, Clark Kent, yeah. You know, you can hardly find a phone booth anymore. Right? So, all right, so here's my, uh, here's my glasses. Let me quickly read. We're just going to go through the first 16 verses. And it says, and again, would you say again? again? The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, would you say so oppressive? The Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. And whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land. Now, I know we got a bunch of campers in this church, but you're nice campers. These guys were not yeah, nice campers, right. okay? They camped on the land, and they what? They ruined the crops all the way to Gaza. And did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. Now, when it says all the way to Gaza, I know you don't have really a good reference point for that. But we're talking several miles in between. Uh, Gideon lives up in the, the area of the country that's kind of centrally located. Gaza was down toward the southwest of the country. We're talking about, you know, them just ravaging the land from, from here to North Grand Rapids. I mean, we're talking about a vast amount of space, probably more than that. Okay? Yeah. And so it says, they not only ruined their crops, but they annihilated all the, the cattle and the donkeys and the sheep. And it says, they came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. Now that's a, that's a picture. How many of you have ever seen video or, or pictures of locusts that, I mean, just are completely, they cover everything. It's amazing. So it's giving us that picture. And it was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Why did they invade the land? To ravage it, okay? Midian so impoverished, would you say so impoverished? So impoverished. The Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. That's a curious phrase to me. 
The Midianites so impoverished Israel that they cried out to the Lord. Why do we wait so long, right? And when the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. Now we shift gears a little bit. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak in Ophrah, at, that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midians, Midianites. I'm sorry. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, "The Lord is with you, mighty warrior." Would you say, "Mighty warrior"? Mighty warrior. But, sir, Gideon replied, "If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us?" Where are all of his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Listen to what God responds with. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, there's another but. God's got to kick our butts out of the way sometimes. But Lord, Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your powerful, transformative word. I pray that you would help our spirits to be open. God, would you open the ears uh, that need to hear today? I believe all of our ears need to hear today what your word says. It's not what I say, God, but what your word says to us. <clears throat> Will you come down and touch us? Would you transform us? Would you challenge us? Would you continue to mold and shape us and reshape us as you desire so that we can be all that you desire us to be, what you have created us for, O oh God, that we will live into the destiny that you have called us to as the people of God? Help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we see it going back to the beginning of chapter 6. That before we even get to Gideon, there's some background that's laid out there. It's established. It's kind of like the large picture, the large view. Okay, and then it, then it really zeroes in into Gideon. But we see that the same symptoms are in both places, right? Uh, that as the nation is, so is that individual. And so we see here that Israel has been oppressed, mostly by the Midianites, as well as the Amalekites and it says other neighboring groups. And how long have they been oppressed? Were you, were you reading with me? Okay, seven years. Say seven years. Seven years. All right, get that in your head. That sounds like a long time, doesn't it? That's as long as I've been away from you. Some of you rejoice. Seven years, that's a long time. A lot of things can change. But why had it happened? And it starts out by telling us why it had happened. Because the Israelites had done evil in the eyes of the Lord. He had given them over to their enemies. You know, sometimes the Lord allows us to be given over to our enemies and we're like Gideon and we're throwing our hands up going, why? I don't understand. Where are the mighty works of God that we've heard about that our parents and our grandparents told us about? But he gave them into the hand of the Midianites. So how bad was the oppression? Verse 2, it says that, uh, that it was so bad that the people began to make shelters. You know, I was thinking about how people in tornado country make, make the shelters underground. You know, I mean, these poor people in Florida, you can't make a shelter to protect yourself from the hurricane and the floods, as we've seen in Houston. But they made shelters. They went out into the mountains. They found places in the cleft of the rock. They found caves. They, they built their own little stronghold, their own little protective place. And it says in verses 3 and 4 that when the crops were planted, how many of you know that planting crops is hard work? And when you did it the way they did back then, it was really hard work. And they would work hard. They would plant their crops and they would start to grow. And then their enemies would say, okay, it's time to go camping, right? And they would show up and they would trample their crops 
And if that wasn't bad enough, they would begin to slaughter all of their animals and they would just totally decimate the land. I mean, you know, it's hard for things to prosper with people like that around, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. And it says that they were like swarms of locusts, impossible to count. And their goal was to ravage. It was to annihilate the land. That was what they were there for. They hated the Israelites. And sometimes people hate us too because of who we belong to. Now, Israel wasn't living up to their destiny. They weren't living like people of God, but they were still God's people. Though they had abandoned God, He had not abandoned them. Amen. It says <clears throat> that the result was they were severely impoverished. So God had removed the covering of His hand. He had removed His blessing. And when God removes His blessing from our lives because of our disobedience, Guess what? There's a void that is there, and guess what it's going to be filled with? The curses of the world. I used to think that, you know, God just, you know, well, if you're not doing what I want to, I'm going to cast curses on you. Well, God allows the curses to come in, but I've come to see that as God removes His blessing and His covering and His anointing from us, we are the ones that have put ourselves in a compromising position. And we are out there for the enemy to just begin to take target practice at us. It's not God's fault, people. And I hear people that make decisions with their own lives and then they get frustrated and they're blaming God for it. It's not God's fault. We need to learn to accept responsibility for that. Especially if we call ourselves the people of God. So impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. That one amazes me. Why does it take a crisis sometimes for God's people to turn to Him? Was it because of their pride? Was it their stubbornness? Was it their spiritual blindness? Was it their spiritual amnesia? How many of you are like me? You're forgetful? Were they looking to other gods to save them? Had they forgotten who God was to them? Had they forgotten whose they were, their truest identity? I believe we forget, and that's our problem. That's why we lose our identity, because we fail to remember. I believe that Israel was experiencing another identity crisis. How many of you have read through the Old Testament and through Israel's history? And you see the pattern repeated over and over, right? This is still fairly early on in their history, and we've already seen it being repeated up to this point in uh, the writing of the Judges and Gideon's testimony. Identity crisis. They had forgotten who God was. They had forgotten His character. That He's a good God. He's a loving God. He's a patient God. They had forgotten His attributes. They had forgotten His mighty acts of salvation on their behalf. God is always working for our, our good. He's always on, uh, on the side of bringing His good into our lives if we'll let Him. It isn't that God is on our side, folks. It's that we should be on God's side. We get it flipped around and turned upside down. Psalm 103, I love Psalm 103. It describes several attributes of God. If you want to turn there, I've got it here. I'm just going to begin to read in verse 1. And the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all of my inmost being. Praise His holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Would you say, forget not all His benefits? Forget not all His benefits. And then he begins to go into what some of those are. I haven't, I, I'm not going to hit the whole chapter but who forgives all your sins and heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. How many of you know that when we're living in disobedience, God is going to confront us? Why? Because he loves us. Yeah. He doesn't want to see us remain in that place where we're headed for destruction. And I'm not talking about just this destruction of the world. We're talking about eternal destruction. This is it. This is for good for all of eternity. Yeah. God wants to bring us close to him. 
Man, I'm really got some dry mouth today. Thank you. He does not treat us. Oh, I love this verse. I've gone through it so many times. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Oh, man. If he gave us what we were worth getting, <laughs> we'd all be in trouble. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. So far as the as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's good news. That's who God is that I serve today. I hope that's the God that you serve today. Is it? All right. And if you've forgotten, you know what? Sometimes I've forgotten. And maybe I haven't forgotten to the point that I've wandered far away from God. But even as a pastor, I would forget how good God was and I would begin to be overwhelmed by my troubles and the things that felt so heavy in my life. And the enemy would uh, rob the joy of the Lord in my life. If he can't get you to turn away from God, he's going to do everything he can to steal the joy away. Have you found that out yet? Let's not give him the satisfaction. So the problem was that Israel was a nation who kept forgetting. And going back to the earlier chapters of Judges, we're just going to hit a couple of places in chapter 2. We're going to kind of get a sense of the pattern to where they are at this point. Chapter 2 of Judges, verses 10, beginning of verse 10. And this is right after Joshua has died. You know, Joshua served them for four 40 years, he was the guy who had to follow in the footsteps of Moses. Talk about an active follow, right? I mean, right. wow, those are some big shoes right. to fill. Right. But because it was the Lord, Joshua was able to do his part in his job. And as soon as he passed away, this is the report. After that, the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, and another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Parents? Did you hear that? Did you catch that? It's not the church's responsibility to train up your children. It's your responsibility as a parent. Amen. And even when we do, that doesn't mean that they grow up to be adults that choose the way of the Lord. That's heartbreaking. But we have to do our part. And even when they become adults and your parenting has to change, as I've learned in these last seven years, you know, I can't send them to their room anymore. <laughs> Two of them are married with their own spouses. That wouldn't work. My youngest is out living on his own. You know, things change. Your, your parenting has to change. And you have to begin to approach it not so much from an authoritarian. You have to build a foundation of love and so that they will be drawn to you and hopefully respect you. And whether they choose to listen to what you say or not, they at least respect what you have to say. That was the Lord. That wasn't in my notes. Okay? And it says, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served the Baals. Those are the other gods of the lands before them. The very thing God had warned them not to do. In verse 12, in the NIV, it uses the word, They forsook the Lord. That's a funny word. They forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. And they provoked the Lord to anger, because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asterisks. That word forsook in the uh, Hebrew means to abandon. It means to leave behind, to desert. It's the idea uh, of, of apostasy, which is apostasy is abandonment to a, a previous idea that you were loyal to or a person that you were loyal to. They abandoned God. Do you remember in the history of Israel before God brought them into the promised land, they stood at the mountain of God and God gave them instruction. And he, he really lays it out. It's amazing. He tells them what their history will be and what the results will be if they don't follow him. There are the blessings and the cursings. God knows all these things right ahead of time. And he laid it out and they said, yes, Lord, we will serve you. Well, you know, how many of us have done that? And then we, we mess it all up, right? They forsook the Lord. Right after Gideon's generation passed on. That's, it's sad. It's, it's heartbreaking. But they had broken God's covenant. I want you to understand that God did not make a contract with Israel in the Old Testament. He made a covenant. There's a huge difference. Yeah. 
In, in the world of business, a contract is you do your part, I do my part, and as long as we continue to do that, we have a working agreement, and then somebody breaks their side of the contract, and then, you know, they try to work it out, and they dissolve it, right? Covenant is more like a marriage. I know people make marriage contracts to, today, and they have prenups and all that. That is not a biblical way of approaching marriage. Marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a promise that says, till death do we part, I will be faithful to you, whether you look great in the morning when you get up, whether you smell good in the morning when you get up, whether you're nice to me or not. You know, again, I, I go back to we're very selfish creatures, aren't we? And so we can deal with some of the negatives from the other people from time to time, but then when it builds up too much and we're focusing so much on them, we think that, well, I don't, you know, we're not in love anymore. You don't fall in love, people. You commit to love. You commit to loving that other person. When you stand at the altar and you give your life to them, this is for life. This isn't just for, well, let's give it a shot. Let's try it out. You know, That's how the world approaches it. Until their little tank runs out. And then they think someone else is going to fill it up for them. The problem is, is they end up a lot of times repeating it. You know? It's not always the case. Sometimes there's some genuine trouble in marriage that can be worked through, but we're not to approach it with a, a contract mindset. It's, a, it's yeah. a covenant mindset. And God has made a covenant with His people, and as we see throughout not just the Old Testament, but the Old, New Testament, one of the pictures of Christ with the church is that the church is the what of Christ? Bride. The bride of Christ. And it's the same thing in the Old Testament, that the church or the people of God, Israel, they were the spouse of God. And you get a really clear picture of this when you read um, Haggai. How many of you ever read Haggai? God tells him and goes, I want you to marry this prostitute. I want you to marry this whore. I say it that way because I want you to understand how graphic the Bible can be. If you think the Bible is boring, you haven't read the same Bible I have. Or you've missed a lot of it. And he tells him to go marry a prostitute. Why does God do that? Because God says, this is the kind of marriage Israel has been to me. Unfaithful. And we see it right here. And so we see it continuing in chapter 3, uh, verse 7. Let's see here. And the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, right? And in verse 9, it says, But when they cried out to the Lord, He raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. Um, chapter 3, verse 12. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. And then down to verse 15. And again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. He gave them a, a deliverer, Ehud, Ehud a left-handed man. Let's hear for the left-handed people out there. All right. A son of, of Benjamin and so forth. And then in verse 31. After Ehud, Ehud came Shamgar, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. He was a bad mama jama. And uh, 600 people. All right? But we see the pattern. Are you getting it? Okay? It, it's continuing. It's going on. And Psalm 78 says, They forgot what he, God, had done. Psalm 78, 11, if you just want to make note of that. And then Psalm 106, there's some scriptures here that kind of follow that testimony. I mean, if you know that uh, sometimes testimonies aren't good in our behalf, right? Those are the ones we want to just make disappear. And uh, <clears throat> in Psalm 106, verse 7, the psalmist records, When our ancestors were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. Would you say gave no thought? Gave no thought. Ooh, wow, that yeah. hurts, doesn't it? Man, sometimes we get so caught up in our lives and what we're doing that we give no thought to God's miracles. We give no thought to what God is doing or wants to do in our lives and around us. They gave no thought to his miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses. And they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Remember, that was the sea that God delivered them from the Egyptians through. He parted the Red Sea and they walked through, it says, on dry ground in Scripture. And then the same sea that was their salvation was the end of the Egyptian army and their power. That's how God operates. Verse 13, But they soon forgot what He had done and did not wait for His plan to unfold. Verse 21, 
They forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt. Yeah. Verse 22, miracles in the land of Ham and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. I've always thought that's funny, the land of Ham. <laughs> but they forgot God. Hmm, forgot God. Back to Judges chapter 6. And so what happens? They're under this great oppression. They f cry out to God. You know, it took seven years. I don't know. Maybe they were trying to work it out and figure it out on their own. Maybe they were trying to muster up their own strength. Maybe they were trying to find their own um, answers to the solutions. And find, you know, God will let us do that, won't he? Yeah. Until we exhaust ourselves, wear ourselves out, we have nothing else within us to, to try to accomplish anything. And I'm so amazed every time we say, God, <clears throat> I'm so in need of you. I need you right now. Yeah. God is so quick to respond. He's just waiting. He's not going to interrupt our will. He says, I gave you a will to choose and live as you want. I want you to submit your will to me. And I've got wonderful, great, and mighty things for you. But if you want to do it yourself, go have fun. But I'll be here if you need me. That's the kind of parenting that we really need, you know. God answers the cries of the Israelites by sending an unnamed prophet. The guy doesn't even get credit because it's not about him. Okay. And how does God respond? In verse 8, God says this. He gives them a quick history lesson. Okay. I brought you up out of Egypt, the land of slavery. Just in case you forgot who I am, I'm that guy. Okay. Verse 9, I snatched you. Oh, I like that word, snatch. I snatched you from the power of Egypt, the hand of your oppressors. Verse 9, I drove them from before you, and I gave you their land. Here he's talking about the land of Canaan, the promised land that he was leading them into. Verse 10, he said, I said, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites. Verse 10, I put it capitalized all in my notes. I'm not going to yell it at you, but here's what God says. But you have not listened to me. You've not listened. And there can be all kinds of reasons why we don't listen to God. We, sorry, my stomach's growling. I'm hungry. We can lose sight of God because of our own pride. We can lose sight of God because of the troubles in our life. We can lose sight of God. Because somebody in the church made me angry and we get mad at God. I don't understand that way of thinking. It's illogical. But it's, that's what happens. Our emotions are illogical, right? Our emotions are powerful and strong and they affect us powerfully. That's why we need the Word of God to bring those emotions that's back right. into alignment. Amen. You have not listened to me. They had not remembered God, who He is. They hadn't remembered His covenant and His commitment to them, His character, His attributes, as we said a moment ago. Forgetting God, who God is, what He has done for them, for us, causes us as believers to lose track of who we are and we lose our truest identity. Who's your creator this morning? Who created you? According to the word of God, God created you, right? David said, he knit me together in my mother's womb. God created you. Therefore, does God have a right to your life? But God is not an overbearing, harsh taskmaster. The problem is that sometimes we get this skewed idea and vision of God in our heads because our identity of God is all messed up. Yeah. And we think that that's who He is because we haven't remembered who He really is. We haven't remembered. Let me tell you this morning who you are in Christ. You are loved and valued by God. You are forgiven and free from your sin and its consequences. If you will repent, that is. <laughs> There's a key. You are chosen by God. You are indwelt by the very Spirit of God. 
You are changed. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. God's peace is firmly in you. You are righteous and holy. And how many of you have done that on your own? <laughs> Whoops, I saw the hand going up. <laughs> Trick question. Okay? We haven't done that on our own. It's all God, right? It's all God. So, forgetting causes us to lose sight of the truth of who God is and who He has created us to be. It's a dangerous place to be, forgetting. Don't suffer from spiritual amnesia. Okay? What are, we, what are ways we can lose sight of our spiritual identity? Giving ourselves. That's right. The phone. It's, well, at least it's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. So we'll take it. She do this to you every week? <laughs> all right, let me get back on track. See, I forget and I want it very quickly, all right? The older I get, it, the worse it is. How can we uh, lose sight of our spiritual identity? We can give ourselves over to fear and anxiety. A lot of people do that. And they go see counselors, and I'm not against counselors, but they... They put their hope in the counselor. Right. They don't put their hope in the Word of God. Right. And if they're going to someone who doesn't believe in the Word of God, <laughs> they're not going to be directed toward the Word of God. Right. And they're going to continue to walk and live in their fear and anxiety. That's one way that we lose our spiritual identity. We uh, Sometimes we become angry toward God or other people, or other Christians, like I said a moment ago. And we may allow anger to get lodged in our heart. Guess what? It's an ugly thing. It's like a cancer that spreads throughout our spirit. And how many of you know it's where our spirit, uh, it's where in our spirit is where the life is, right? We also can lose our spiritual identity by suffering from issues of distrust. Uh, there's people in here perhaps that have been hurt over and over by others and it's hard for you to trust people. I understand that. But whatever our issue is in the realm of the flesh, it's not to be an excuse before the presence of God. Okay? We can also lose our identity by believing lies about our identity. How many of you have ever had people as you were growing up as a kid say mean things about you? And it impacted you. And even today, whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, we'll stop there. Um, you still remember those hurtful words, right? They still have a little bit of pain attached to them. Words are powerful. What people say about us is powerful. Your very words have the power to shape someone's direction in their life. To build them up or to tear them down. Perhaps our identity has been affected because we've been holding on to offense. Not offense. <laughs> offense. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. That's a powerful tool that the enemy uses, unforgiveness. He can really make us stumble over that one. And we can hang on to issues for years and years and years. And can I tell you one thing that I've learned, and I'm not saying it makes it any easier for me, but when I learned to listen to the Word of God, allow the Word of God to impact me and cleanse my heart and my life, and I step out in faith and begin to forgive others for what they've done, it doesn't matter about the other person in a sense. The, for, un, the forgiveness is so that I can let go and receive the life of God. It doesn't matter if they ever say, well, I've, that's okay, I did wrong. I mean, that's what we want to hear. Our flesh wants to hear that. But can I tell you that in the Lord, you don't need to hear that because you've already heard the words of God. He says, I love you. I've called you. You're mine. That's what we need to listen to and hear this morning. We can lose our spiritual identity by selfish pursuits. Just simply, you know what? I want to do what I want to do, right? Putting me ahead of God and even other people. That's one reason why a lot of relationships don't work, because you got selfish people involved. The word identity by uh, Brother Webster means this. Who someone is. Who someone is. 
It's the qualities or beliefs that make a particular person or group different from others. It's a distinguishing character or personality of an individual. Do you realize that you are like no other person on the place of this earth right now, walking the face of this earth, whether in history past or in history to come? There's not another one like you that will ever be like you, that ever has been like you. That boggles my mind. Sometimes people around me are going, I'm so thankful. <laughs> There's only one of them, right? <laughs> But there's no one like you. And as a person, your identity is uniquely your own. And I want to encourage you, I, I want to compel you this morning. If, if you've allowed your heart to drift away from the Lord or from the Word of God, and, and some of these things that we, I just touched on that cause us to lose our spiritual identity, would you heed not my words, but the words of the Holy Spirit who is reaching out to you this morning and say, you know what? I need to ask God to forgive me with this or that or whatever that particular issue is. The Holy Spirit, I know He's speaking to us right now. You see, regarding our identity, God has not just changed our perception. He hasn't just changed our direction. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. In fact, God has changed our identity. He has gone to the very core of who we are. He has given us a God-given identity, the very core of who we are according to how God sees us, not how you see yourself or how anyone else sees you. Do you know how God sees you this morning? We've hit on some scriptures that give us some hints and ideas on how God sees looks at you, how he thinks of you, how he is drawn to you, because he created you. He loves you more than anyone else ever can. I once was in spiritual darkness. Now I live in his light. I once was a spiritual orphan. Now I am a child of God. I was once spiritually dead, but now I am alive with a super abundance of God's life living in me. Not just an abundance. The scriptures uses the idea of superabundance. It's just like so much more than we can even imagine or try to contain on our own. I, I think about all the waters that fell on poor Houston recently. A year's worth of rain in a couple of days. That's insane. That's a superabundance. Now that was a destructive force, but God's love is not a destructive force. It is a force that will give us life in an unending fashion. Our truest identity is bound up in who God declares us to be and how well we remember not only what he has saved us from, but what he has called us into. Now, sometimes in our testimonies, we talk about what God saved us from. Well, that's great, but that's only part of the story. What has he saved you into? What has he saved you for? Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's, that's where the story really yeah. is. Right. 1 Corinthians 1 9, God, who has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ, is faithful. Do you realize that the, the crux, I don't see the crux is here. <laughs> the crux of that verse is God is faithful. It's three words. You know what? I love when the Holy Spirit expands it out and he throws in some extras. And he says, Who has called you? Would you say me? me. God has called me. Say that. God has called me. He has called you into fellowship, not just with anybody, but with his son, Jesus Christ. Mm. You see, not forgetting is vital to staying grounded in our truest identity as given by God. We need to remember whose we are. Not who we are. That's important, but it's even greater of importance than whose we are, right? To maintain our identity as declared over us by God, we must remember. We must remember. So here we are now in verse chapter 11, or verse 11, I'll get it out, verse 11, chapter 6. And so we're going now to the man Gideon. Here we see Gideon. Man, uh, he is a man that's plagued by fear, okay? 
He's plagued by the fact that his enemies have overrun his nation, his country, his land. And what does it say that Gideon is doing? He is out there and he's threshing wheat. Do you thresh wheat in a wine press? <laughs> what do you do in a wine press? You crush grapes, right? I don't know, maybe some of you don't know that when the Old Testament times, when they would thresh wheat, they would find a, an elevated place, and sometimes they would create a flat surface, large surface, they would bring the wheat in, and they would trample it, they had different methods of doing it, they had instruments, where they, wooden instruments where they beat it, so they try to separate the hull from the grain, you know, the hull is that worthless piece, you know, and then what they would do is they'd create the piles, and then they would throw them up in the air so that as the wind blew, it would blow the worthless stuff away and the stuff that you really want stays around, right? Mm -hmm. And so you had to be out in an open place. Well, Gideon wasn't in an open place. He was huddled down in a wine press. And, and Gideon was a man who, we find out later, he had servants with him. So he wasn't out there by himself. There was a group of them. And so I can just imagine in my head, they're out there working and they're threshing the wheat and probably some of them are on guard duty. They're looking for their enemies to appear so that if they have to, they can grab what they need, run, hide, do whatever they need to. This is a man who's been living under the subjugation of another group of people for a long time. And how many of you know when you're in that position uh, and you lose hope that there's anything different than come out, that can come out of it, you're just trying to survive. You have a survivalist mentality. How many of you know that God doesn't want you to just be a survivor? Yeah. He wants you to be an overcomer. He wants you to be a person who is filled with His abundance because He has so much more for you if you just begin to believe it. And so there He is. And this angel shows up. Gideon is a man with an identity crisis. His family are, are worshipers of other gods. They worship Baal. And they worship Asherah. Baal was the male deity of the Canaanites. There were various, very, various variations. That's repetitive, repetitive. Um, there were variations of the gods of Canaan that were served. But, but basically it was Baal and Asherah was a, a female god. They were fertility gods. And we're not going to get into how disgusting that worship involved was involved. But there were prostitutes involved, male and female. That was part of their worship. And just horrible things that would come out of that. And that was how they worshiped God. And when I was younger, I used to think, okay, Israel turned away from God. They're completely ignoring God. But what I began to realize as I got older and studied, here's the thing, that they didn't totally turn away from God. They didn't stop worshiping God and say, we don't care about God anymore. They just brought these other gods in with God. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I don't know what's worse. Maybe that's worse. Yeah. But that's that lukewarm thing that Jesus talks about. And we know where that gets us. And so here they are, worshiping other gods. Gideon says, by his own uh, declaration, my clan is the weakest, it's the most insignificant in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And then on top of that, if that's not bad enough, Gideon says, well, I'm the least in my whole family. Boy, this guy's got a pretty low image of himself, doesn't he? He doesn't, he doesn't have much confidence at all. Isn't it funny that that's who God's choosing? He says, God has abandoned us. Where are the wonders and miracles of God? Why has he allowed us to be subdued by our enemies? He's living in fear, threshing wheat in a wine press. This is the identity that Gideon has of himself when the angel of the Lord appears to him. <clears throat> this is what hit me, and I wrote it down. I'm going to read it. If we do not continually gaze into the face of God and His Word, striving to see Him clearly, we will begin to forget the accurate image of God, diminishing Him in our own understanding, and we end up with a God who is less than the God of Scripture. And guess what we've done at that point? Created a God in our own image. We think of idol worship as this little thing, you know, made out of wood, stone, fine... You know, precious metals. And that's what we think of. But we know that as Americans, we have our own idols that we serve. They may not take, you know, that kind of an image or shape. But we, we chase after material things. We chase after the things that the world offers us. And we say, oh, well, you know, I haven't stopped serving God. I'm just going to let that come in too. And, and, and we, 
we put God on the same level as all of these other gods. And we're guilty. And we're guilty. So the angel of the Lord arrives. And I really believe that the angel of the Lord in, in, was really a pre-incarnate yeah. image of Jesus Christ himself, that he came before he was born on the earth. And we see a few times in Old Testament scripture where this happens. I really believe it was Jesus himself. Because when you see the story and, and see how the interaction goes. But the angel of the Lord says this. Okay, we've just talked about who Gideon was, who he thinks of himself, who he, how he thinks of his family, right? Is he full of a lot of confidence? Does he think he's the man? Right? No. Here's what the angel of the Lord says. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Can you hear <laughs> his brain getting jumbled up, him going, what? I know you're not talking to me. You must have met one of my servants here. You know, I mean, it's just blowing him out of the water. Did Gideon look like a mighty soldier, a mighty warrior at this moment in time? Not at all. He looked like a cowardly man, and he was acting like one too. But the angel of the Lord proclaimed something over Gideon that Gideon cannot see. Aren't you glad that, that God proclaims things over us that we can't see? Because God has the truest and most accurate picture of your identity of who he has created you to be, who he longs for you to be, and all of the wonderful things that God wants to not only do for you, it's not just about for us, but it's through us so that he can expand his kingdom in this world, right? Hmm. The angel of the Lord proclaims something over Gideon that he cannot see. Here's what the angel of the Lord is not proclaiming over Gideon, what he sees in the natural. Yeah. Aren't you glad that God doesn't yeah. proclaim what he sees in the natural over our lives? But rather, he is proclaiming the truth of a supernatural identity of Gideon. He creates a spiritual paradigm shift for Gideon. Probably blows Gideon's little mind out of the water, but sometimes we need that, right? If we don't have someone come in and jolt us, we keep moving down the same path. But until someone comes in and, you know, maybe whacks us upside the head... <laughs> We'll continue in the same pattern or we can't get started in a new direction. Have you ever needed or experienced someone speaking supernatural truths over you instead of what was seen in the natural realm? I don't need people to call me stupid. I've done enough of that to myself, right? Anyone know what I'm talking about? However, when God speaks over us, it is eternal life. It is strengthening. It is life altering and changing, empowering, transforming. God has so much more planned for you and I than we can stop, uh, that, we, that we can even imagine. But we need to stop and spend time with the Lord. We need to come into his presence. We need to come into his word. And we need to hear what God's truth says about who we are. And it's not because we're such great people to start with, but it's because God is such a great God and can change and transform and reshape. And what I thought was cool in verse 13, you know, Gideon's going on with his reasoning and his excuses, but the angel of the Lord, how does he respond? He doesn't say anything about all of that. He just ignores it. Oh, I won't worry about what Gideon's saying here. Here's what I'm going to say. That you are a mighty warrior. I want you to hear that. Don't, don't, don't listen to your own self and your excuses and, and what you're struggling with right now. But rather, the angel of the Lord just doesn't even deal with that. But here's what he says. He says, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian. Strength that I have? I don't have any strength. Didn't you get that, angel, Mr. Angel? <laughs> Didn't you hear that my clan is the least of all the ones in, in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and my family is the least of them, and I'm the least of my family? No, the angel of the Lord says, go in the strength you have. Maybe you ever had God repeat himself to you. Go in the strength you have, and I will give the Midianites into your hands. I will be with you, verse 14, and I will strike down the Midianites. You will strike down the Midianites together. 
There's two things that jump out at me there. The angel of the Lord says, go in the strength that you have. I will be with you. See, again, we, we focus so much on ourselves and we're making it about ourselves. How can I go defeat the Midianites? But he says, you don't have much strength. In fact, you may not have any strength. But guess what? I'll be with you. I'll be with you. You know how much strength I have? <laughs> Come on, child. We can, you and I, we're a majority here. The enemy doesn't stand a chance. Right? But we forget that. Because we forget who God is. We forget his identity. And we allow that to, to, to twist our understanding of who we, who we are in our own eyes. We forget our identity. I think the Lord wants to remind us whose we are this morning. So, go in the strength you have. I will be with you. He doesn't say go to some uh, seminar leadership, okay? Go work out for a year. Get really buff and be, get ready for the enemy. You know, look like Samson after a year. You know, it doesn't say go raise a lot of money. You know, we need funds. We need a lot of, uh, you know, uh, ammunition. We need a lot of stuff to go against this, uh, this enemy of ours. No, it doesn't say that. But take what you have right now and move forward in faith. And then the second thing that strikes me is he says it twice, actually. I will be with you. And then he puts in the form of a question, am I not sending you? Am I not sending you? I will be with you. I will be with you. Will be with you. Maybe someone here today needs to say, let's say it out loud for the sake of if it's only one. God is with me. God is with me. He will be with me. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. I call this the declaration of with. The declaration of with that God is with us. It's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, it says, The Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Matthew 28, 20, Jesus said as he was getting ready to leave earth, and he was leaving his disciples with this huge mission. I want you to go and change the world. Twelve guys, right? A little bit more than that. And he says to them, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I mean, if you know, Jesus is there to the end. He's not going to leave us. Before that, he'll never leave us. So why can Gideon have confidence in going in the strength he has? Because he's led by, he's surrounded by, he's resourced by, he's strengthened by the same God who decimated Egypt with his mighty power, with the plagues of Egypt, and brought his people out of the land of slavery, and in fact just didn't bring them out, but loaded them down with the very riches of Egypt. They plundered the Egyptians, these slaves, on their way out to the promised land. That's why Gideon can have that kind of confidence. That's why we can have that kind of confidence, because God is able to do exceedingly abundantly greater, right? God was reorienting Gideon's identity. He was giving him a new identity, an identity that was grounded in the truth of who God was, because Gideon had forgotten. Gideon is a man at this point, so seven years, you know, it wasn't like he grew up without a knowledge of God. I'm sure he had heard about God. In fact, maybe his family worshipped God along with all the other Baals and Asherahs and other, other uh, uh, deities of the area. But God was revealing himself in a powerful way, reorienting his identity, giving him a new identity, an identity based on who God was. That God is good. He wants to give us good things. That he's loving. That he's kind. He's forgiving. He heals us. He's compassionate. He's full of grace. He's slow to anger. And he's abounding in love. That's who God is. That is for you today. He's not for you because you're such a great and wonderful person. I might think so. But, you know, in relation to how holy and pure and righteous God is, none of us stand a chance to say, hey, I can approach you on my own merit. None of us can. The Bible makes it clear. Hmm. So this morning, what are the things that are holding you back in your walk with God? What are the things that are holding you back in your life? What is keeping you from fulfilling the destiny that God has declared over you? 
God has a destiny for your life. Don't squander the most precious gift that God has given you. Don't be like the, the parable that Jesus told of the three stewards, remember? He tells a story about a, a wealthy man who's going away for a while, so he distributes some of his wealth to his servants, and he gives you know, one guy this much, and one guy this much, and then the third guy he doesn't give a whole lot because he knows the character of the guy, right? He knows his integrity and how he thinks. But he gives him a chance, and the first two do well. They go out and they double the money, and, and they do good with what the master gave them. But the, the third guy, remember why he didn't do it? What did he do, first of all? He buried it, right? Why did he bury it? Because I serve a harsh, a harsh master. The other two didn't think that way, did they? It's the same master. What's the difference here? It's the servants. It's the way they think, exactly. And so they think of God as someone who's harsh, who's, who's looking to bang them over the head the moment they do something wrong. He's mad at them. He doesn't really like them. And so what does the guy do? He goes and he buries the talent. He says, I don't want to take any risks because I know how my master is. He didn't know his master, did he? The master returns, holds him accountable. Guess what? He was banished. He was banished. The master said, you could have at least put it in the bank, dingling. And you'd have gotten interest back on it. You don't even have to work that hard. Just put it in the bank. But he couldn't even have the faith to do that. There's a far greater spiritual principle. I'll let you figure that out. Where have you forgotten God in some way? Distorting that supernatural identity that the Father has given you. Where have you distorted your perception of God? Have you? Think about it. Ask yourself the question. Have you ever said, maybe you're struggling with, God doesn't love me? God is against me? Man, every time I try to do something, it just it's always a mess. God hates me. He's against me. Maybe you're of the mindset that God fails me? Or God won't forgive me. I've heard people say that. Oh, but you don't know. God won't forgive me. Yes, he will. You just have to ask. Or God, you fill in the blank, right? So in talking about identity, we're talking about a biblical concept of being. Doing versus being. That's the tension in, in serving the Lord. That's the tension in the world uh, of the church, of the church world. We start to focus more on doing and less on being. Yeah. And guess what? It doesn't work well, does it? We need to slow down and we need to get ourselves grounded in who God is, His character, His attributes, who is calling us to be. We need to focus on the being. And then the doing comes a whole lot more naturally. And it's a joy in that, in that way of doing it. I, I heard a message recently by a young pastor. His name is Jeremy Austell. And he said that uh, doing without being is hard labor that produces fatigue and frustration. <laughs> right? When you're doing it in your own strength, you can do it pretty good for a while. But after a while, it gets frustrating and it just wears you down and you burn out. Right? That's, when that's happening, let me tell you, that's not God's plan. Then you're not, you're not in sync with God somewhere along the line. We must do, but first we must become, or we must find ourselves in the realm of being. The realm of being is that place where we become content with the presence of God more than anything else. That where we are more concerned with who we are before God than anyone else. Did you know that God's dream for you, this is what, this is something else I picked up from Jeremy. He said, God's dream for you is that you would breathe God in, that he would flow through you, and then that you would breathe God out and that you would live in the pleasure, in his pleasure, and that you would walk in companionship and partnership with him. God's inviting you into partnership, into companionship. We forget that. We lose our identity. God's dream for your life is him. I know that for us, you know, from a human level, we go, wow, that's pretty neat. Full of himself. <laughs> He's God. Everything has come out of God. I mean, all the life that there is comes from God. So remember this. 
You know, sometimes we pastors get it all messed up. I'll, I'll confess. We say, you know, invite Jesus into your life. We don't see, we don't see the angels saying, well, just invite me into your life, do we? It's the other way around. He's inviting Gideon to, into God's life. He's inviting Gideon into life. Jesus is inviting you into his life and his abundance. We're not inviting him in. He's inviting us in. And God did not create you this morning to live in fear, to live under depression. He didn't create you to live under oppression. He didn't create you to live less than the best that he has for you. If you're finding yourself there this morning, you need a spiritual chiropractic adjustment. Yeah. Okay? You need to hear the word of God. You need to allow the truth of God to sink into your ears, into your mind, and into your spirit this morning. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 12. Here's what the gospel writer says. Yet to all who did receive him, meaning Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or even a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen the glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Who's writing that? John, right? Did John hang out with Jesus? Yeah. He's a first-hand eyewitness account, isn't he? And this is what he's telling us. That we are born of God. We're born of God. I'm going to share a quote in closing. George McDonald. I don't know if it's... He's not related to McDonald's. You know, the Golden Arches. <laughs> this guy was way before that. He was a Scottish preacher in the early to mid-1800s. And he says this. I would rather be what God chose to make me than the most glorious pre creature I could think of. For to have been thought about and born in God's thought and then made by God is the dearest, grandest, most precious thing in all of thinking. God doesn't need any pointers from you and I, does he? He's got the plan. We just have to submit to it. This morning, what I want to do as we close is <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We're going to speak the Word of God over, over one another. So what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll say something. I want you to repeat after me. I want it to enter into your ears. I want it to seep into your mind, down deep into your spirit this morning. Because again, these are my words. These are the words of Scripture. Life-giving Scripture. And I hope that they get deep in and, and that the Holy Spirit is, is beginning to do a work. If you need some adjustment in your spirit, that He is he's calling out to you. He is, he is whispering your name and you're hearing it. You're hearing the Holy Spirit say, I love you this morning. You may have abandoned me, but I have not abandoned you. I am with you. I'm not going to leave you. And if you're not ready, I'm, I'm going to wait. I'll be there. I'll be there. It's 14 things, and it's going to maybe sound familiar because of Scripture. Hopefully it does. It means you've been reading. There is no condemnation for me because I am in Christ Jesus. Would you repeat that? Repeat, Jesus Christ has set me free. Jesus Christ has set me free. From the power of sin and death. From the power of sin and death. Third, God sent Jesus to cover the penalty of my sin. God sent Jesus to cover the penalty of my sin. Number four, I live by God's Spirit. I live by God's Spirit. And therefore I have my heart and mind. On what the Spirit desires. Let it get down into your spirit this morning. Verse 5. I or number 5. I am controlled by the Spirit of Christ. And therefore I belong to Jesus. Number 6. I am led by the Spirit of God. And therefore I am a son or daughter of God. Number 
Verse 7, I am not afraid because God did not give me a spirit of fear. I am not afraid because God did not give me a spirit of fear. Number 8, God's Spirit tells me that I am a child of God. God's Spirit tells me that I am a child of God. Number 9, God's Spirit intercedes for me. God's Spirit intercedes for me. Number 10, God is working for my good. God is working for my good. Because I love Him and am devoted to Him. Because I love Him and am devoted to Him. Now let me pause for a moment on that one. Because really it's the other way around. <laughs> right? Yeah. God is working for me because He loves me so much. Yeah. It's, not, it's not hinging upon how loyal I am to Him. He's loyal to me regardless, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, number 11. God loves me and is for me. Are you believing us this morning? Number 12. Nothing will separate me from the love of Christ. Not trouble or hardship. Or persecution or famine. Or nakedness or sword. Number 12. I am more than a conqueror through Christ. You're not just a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. Yeah. Why? Because you are a God. You are serving a God who is more than everything, right? Yeah. And 14, the last one. Not death nor life. Not death nor life. Neither angels nor demons. Neither the present nor the future. Nor any powers. Neither height nor depth. Nor anything else in all creation. Here it comes. Can separate me from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. I want you to let that sink in right now. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would take your word, you begin to apply it to our lives, not just to the superficial levels, but Lord, I pray that you would go deep into the depths of our spirit where transformation takes place. Work within us. Holy Spirit, overcome the obstacles that are there. Overcome the false sense of identity of who we think we are or who we think you are. God, forgive us this morning. If you need to confess and ask God to forgive you because you've been looking at him wrong, thinking about him wrong, you've been allowing a, a false identity to take over your life, I want you to, to give that to Jesus this morning. I want you to say, please forgive me. Change me. Make me new inside. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you will work right now in these moments, in these moments.